Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another House Rules video. In this video, I'm going to be looking at classes, or at least the things you use to start a character off. So, while classes in Dungeons & Dragons, for example, are involved in you going up levels and what abilities you gain, I'm not going to be looking at that. I'm not going to be looking at how you improve your characters later on, whether you're buying skill points with experience or whether you're using experience to buy levels. Not going to do that yet. What I'm looking at is how you start characters off. So in some games you choose a class, in some you have a template you buy, in others you go through careers, in yet others you go through a life path to generate your character. But we'll have a look at a bunch of those on the tabletop, and then at the end I'll be back with the document for the rule system that we're coming up together and show you what I've come up with. But let's go over to the tabletop. So, first of all, we will start off with the biggest game, Dungeons & Dragons. Now, Dungeons & Dragons uses classes, if I turn over to page 71, like so many other games. So, for example, the Deadlands games, you choose your class. You're choosing whether you're being a gunfighter, a lawman, etc. In Earthdawn, you're choosing to be a sword fighter or a thief or a wizard or whatever. In even the World of Darkness games, you know, Vampire, Werewolf, you're choosing your tribe or your clan. You're basically choosing the niche into which your character plays. But Dungeons & Dragons, uh, stopping the characters being quite as samey, so every human fighter will be the same, added something quite interesting. Now, in the D&D Next playtest packages, it was far more important. And they're doing something fairly interesting with the one D&D version of it. Although we'll see how much of that actually makes it through to a rulebook. So if I turn on to page 128, we can see backgrounds. A few pages on. And basically you're choosing something which customizes it. So my favorite one, because I used it quite successfully, is the charlatan. I played a human monk charlatan. So... He's an ordinary human monk. He can go around punching things very fast and using his key and all that. But his background was charlatan. So while he appeared to be the mystic monk of the East, you know, very much um, Kane out of the Kung Fu television series, he claimed to be the chosen one who has a destiny. He was actually just an ordinary guy who was lying about this destiny. So... Your background adds an interesting quirk. You get some extra skill proficiencies, tool proficiencies, plus you get some interesting other things. So, feature, false identity. You have created a second identity that includes documentation, established acquaintances, and disguises that allow you to assume that persona, which is what I used heavily for my Hmong. And obviously we've got criminal ones here, where they've got criminal contacts, um, entertainers, including variant entertainer Gladiator, and you can put these in either very normally, so an entertainer, for example, makes a very obvious bard. But you can add it into different classes to really quirk them out and make them interesting. And that combination of race, class and background actually creates far more combinations and makes the D&D system far more interesting than just the old race-class combinations. I'm really impressed with that. Next up, I would like to present... Why I Fancy Roleplay. Now this is the first edition, it's an original Games Workshop one, not a reprint from Hogshead, although they're identical pretty much. Now Why I Fancy Roleplay uses classes as well, but in a slightly different way. So if I turn to page 16, we can see the different classes, and there are only four of them. There's Warriors, Rangers, Rogues, and Academics. So combined with the four races, that's not a lot of variety. That's only 16 possibilities in the entire game. However, characters can be very, very different. Because if we flip over the page here, we can see there's a random chance of rolling different careers. And careers are what make the classes slightly different. So we look here and we can see that there are nobles and outlaw possibilities. So let's have a look at those, because they're on the same page. They're on page 32. Now, if you're rolling up a human warrior, you've got a chance of starting as a nobleman. So you roll your random chance and you get these skills. 50% chance of gamble, 50% of public speaking, 25% of consume alcohol, etc. You start off with various trappings. You start off with a horse and expensive clothes. 
2d6 gold crowns, jewelry worth 10d6 gold crowns, d4 hangers on. But if you'd rolled up a outlaw, then you get these skills, 75% chance of drive cart, 75% chance of ride horse, 50% chance of animal care, 25% chance of marksmanship, 25% of secret signs woodman. But your trappings are, you get bow and ammunition, a shield, and a 50% chance of a leather jerkin. So you start off with far less. So characters can be radically different, all based on a random roll. And it is a very random series. Um, system, sorry. It can be very, very interesting. And some of the options in here are fantastic. Um, one of my favourites is definitely Rat Catcher. The idea of starting off as a noble warrior, but your character actually begins as a rat catcher, is fantastic. It definitely sets the tone of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay as grandeur, but it doesn't let you think about your character ahead of time. You've got to roll it up and then think about what your character's going to be like. It makes the game very rules dependent on what you're making your characters, but it can be an interesting system. Next up, I would like to present Shadowrun. Now, this is 5th edition, but all the versions basically work in the same way. Now, if I turn to page 65, being careful not to hit the camera, because this is a really thick tone, we can see there are detailed rules on creating your character. So we've got here where, as I mentioned last time about races, you get to choose your priorities. You get to choose whether you're being a meta type, so being a race with extra abilities, or whether you're spending your points on attributes, whether you can cast magic, skills, resources. And the next few sections go through assigning your attribute points, choosing the way your magic works, advantages and disadvantages, or positive and negative qualities as Shadowrun calls them. Lots of pages of those. Choosing your skills, spending your resources, so getting all your equipment. Your final steps where you can buy extra things like contacts. And it details it that way. Now, this creates a very individual character, but takes a long time because that's us gone through about 40 pages on character uh, creation. 42 pages up to here. But if you want to just get playing, they've got a lot of pre built templates here. So you can be Street Samurai, a cover top specialist. And these fill in gaps in the party. So we've got uh, Street Shamans, Brawling Adepts. Combat mages, face weapon specialists, deckers, tanks, technomancers, um, smugglers, drone riggers, sprawl gangers, bounty hunters. And these allow you just to choose something and get playing, which is a very nice way of doing it. Um, the Star Wars D6 role playing game used a very similar system where you could create an individual character by choosing your race, spending your attribute points and skill points spending your sort of starting money or getting uh, any starting equipment or you could just do, choose a template now templates are really good because they fill in gaps in the party so you can choose to have the gunman the healer and all that in Shadowrun but they are very very set there's not a lot of choice you're coming with all set starting advantages and disadvantages all your equipment set you're not getting much choice at all but that doesn't stop you from making an interesting character. Next, I would like to present GURPS. Now, GURPS is the ultimate points buy system. So at its very basic level, you are spending a certain amount of points you start off with. The Games Master decides how many, but there are various recommended amounts to buy your attributes, to buy your skills, and to buy any starting equipment. But if you want to add things to that, you know, take it up to super heroic levels, then the Games Master just gives you more points. And you can buy extra abilities, so in the form of advantages and disadvantages here. So you can buy legal enforcement powers, lightning, lightning calculator, intuition, immunity to disease, magic resistance, various abilities, by spending some of your starting points to buy those. And you can take disadvantages, or you can buy, uh, sorry, to carry on with the advantages, you can buy allies, you can buy patrons. But you've got your disadvantages as well. So you're going to be born in poverty. You're going to have a social stigma. You can be old. You can be blind. You can be overweight. You can have a code of honour. You can be a bully. You can be unreasonably honest. You can be a fanatic. 
and these give you points. So if you want to be stronger than everybody else, you can take a disadvantage, which gives you points, which you can then spend on increasing your strength. Or if you want to be like Superman, and um, you're buying a superhero advantage of incredible strength, then you can be taking something like a vulnerability to kryptonite in your disadvantages. Now this allows an immense amount of uh, flexibility. You can create anything you want. To help with this, they have added little kits, basically. I pointed out in the races video last time, if you want to be a dwarf, for example, then you can buy the dwarf as a kit, which is a set amount of advantages and disadvantages, which make you a dwarf. So you'll be shorter, so move slightly slower, you'll be slightly stronger, etc. And the dwarf kit will just be bought as that. Or you can buy all those advantages and disadvantages and make your character totally separate. But GURPS is unique and basically allows you to do anything you want. You can really create anything you want as long as you've got the imagination for it. But it does take a long time because you are buying points and you're spending it. Lots of calculations involved. And last, I would like to present Twilight 2000, this absolutely massive, gorgeous box which barely fits on camera. So I'll discard the box and we'll just have a look at the player's manual. Now, Twilight 2000 is based on the older Twilight 2000 by Games Designers Workshop. But like many other games that we've talked about, you can use templates. So we've got the civilian here, the grunt, the gunner, the kid, the mechanic, the medic, the officer, the operator. And these fulfill uh, parts of the group or they fulfill story factors. You know, the kid is majorly in sort of fiction where the team's got a kid around who's useful but they're not absolutely essential to the military operations of the group. But because this is based on older Games Designers Workshop games, which tended to use life paths. So, with your life path, you start off as a child and you pick up skills based on what kind of background you're from, whether you're working class, you come from a small town, you're an intellectual, and then you random roll and what skills you pick up. And then you follow them through their life. Perhaps they went into military service and there's different careers and what skills they pick up from that and what equipment they might have. Whether in the United States Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, whether they were in the Soviet Union, whether they were in Swedish, and whether they're in Polish or the local militias. And then we've got civilian experience as well. So they could have served time in the police. They had a, were working in a life of crime. They worked for intelligence, such as the CIA or KGB. They're in blue-collar work. They're in education or white-collar work. And then finally we've got the element when the war breaks out, the last year of their life, it details what went through. You know, they ended up being a brawler or a rifleman. And that's how you do that. You're rolling in elements as you go through their life, and they're picking up skills and equipment and becoming a more detailed character. Now, the advantages and disadvantages of this in Twilight 2000 is you can keep going through careers, but your character getting older. Now, older characters become less survivable, and when they get to extreme ages, they start to lose attribute points. So you can pick up loads and loads of skills and have tons of experience and equipment and be absolutely amazing, but you're old, so you're likely to die when you get hurt. And you've lost attribute points, so you are getting worse as you get older. Or you can be young, easily able to survive damage thrown at you, but you will have far less starting skills and equipment than other people. Now, this is very similar to Traveller. And my group has a saying that it's not Traveller unless you can die in character creation. Because the character creation in Traveller did have elements where you could keep going and you could be getting, like, starships and things. Your character could be ranking up to Admiral. You know, gaining extreme amounts of influence, extreme amounts of equipment, and extreme amounts of skills. But the longer you kept going, the higher chance there was that you just died. So your character would die before it ever started play. The character creation itself was pretty much a game in to see how much you could get before your character died, and you had to discard that one and start again. 
a fantastic character creation system that takes a lot of time, which is why this version of Twilight 2000 is very, very wise in having the templates. So you can just pick up a character type and start playing straight away. So we've opened up the rules file and hopefully I'll remember to link it down below. I've been pretty good recently, so fingers crossed. At the beginning of the file, there's not many changes, although I have added the quote out of the Dungeons and Dragons Only a Game religious leaflet that I looked at last week, where it says that role-playing games are the most effective, most magnificently packaged, most profitably marketed, most thoroughly researched introduction to the occult in man's recorded history by Dr. Gary North, author of None Dare Call It Witchcraft, which I thought was a fantastic quote to use because he's talking about all role-playing games. I like putting that one in. And it does seem well suited to this hell on earth setting that we've come up with. Now, carrying on through, as I said, not much has changed. We've got the character creation, we've got the races here. And I have gone with a life path system, because I really do like it. Now, I would use this to create various templates so you can have quick start characters. And I think those quick start characters would be based around different parts of the Hellcop department that the players will be part of. So you get med techs, you get special weapons and tactics officers, you get investigators, and you could choose to be one of them. Or you can go through your life path and generate a detailed character. Now, this is just some ideas. These aren't fully fleshed out, and they need a lot more added to them. There's a lot of um, events of uneventful year in here. But, for example, the character, every character progresses through life to adulthood. They must choose one childhood, one for each year of their youth, and one for each year of their adulthood. So, childhood, they choose from rural or city, and they get animal handling plus one, survival plus one for rural, or streetwise and security for city. Now, they're not terribly well done, and there should be a lot more there. It will also be nice to put in some descriptive background into it. For their youth years, so they've got eight years of youth, so they go through school. They can go to sports, where they gain a plus one to athletics, a plus one to intimidation. Because all guys in sports are bullies, aren't they? Okay, that's maybe a bit of a stereotype, but what the hell? They can go specialise in driver's ed, so get piloting and repair. Science, science and research. Debate, persuasion and performance. Computer, computer and research. Street, sneaking and brawling. So they skipped out of class and they were on the streets. Maybe that shouldn't be brawling, maybe it should be deception. But I think of, you know, teenage scamps getting in fights and getting in trouble. Now then they go on to adulthood. Now you've got seven years of this until your character reaches maturity, which is when they kind of become... Uh, player character. Everybody's going to be 25. It's an easy way of keeping it balanced rather than going back to the traveler system of including lots of ways of characters dying, aging effects, that kind of thing, to try and balance out the extra experience somebody would get for going through loads of careers. Just setting it that everybody starts at 25 so everybody gets seven years of adult skills. Now you can go through these. Now some of the events... You get skill points, sorry. So you get plus two skill points to spend between the skills they offer. So going to university, you've got science, research, or computers. And you can add plus two to any one of those, or plus one to two of them. You've got two points to spend. And then you roll a d6. And if you roll a one, you get plus one to your intelligence. Two, plus one to your education. Three, you've made a long-term friend in education, which can be used as a contact. Four, you've done some important research, which can be used to increase your education by plus one when it's connected to that area of research. That obviously needs detailed out more, but they can become a researcher into a particular type of technology and get to improve their education stat when dealing with that type of technology. A five is an uneventful year, which means I couldn't really think of anything to put in there. Six, they were kicked out and they cannot continue in university. So you might decide that your character wants to do seven years at university to become a real specialist in science research computers, but you roll badly and they get kicked out in the first year. So they have to go on to something else. We've got ones hit the athlete, which you get the bonus stats, you get long term friends, you get increased starting money because you did particularly well and you won a, a prize of some kind. 
But you can also get fame because you won a prize, which can be used to increase your charisma by plus one. So you won the championship boxing at that low level, and you can mention that in conversation and get a bonus to your charisma when you bring it up. Or you can be injured, which loses you one point of agility, and you cannot continue in sports. There's a military one, where you can get kicked out and dishonoured, so you'll get minus to charisma when dealing with military. Or an injury, minus one to endurance, you cannot continue in the military, so you get mustered out. But you've got different advantages here. So you've got plus one to strength, endurance, or you can get promoted, which can be used to increase your charisma by plus one. When speaking to people, oh, well, I was a lieutenant in the US Marines. Bring it up in conversation and get a bonus. There's working in warehouses. You know, you got accused of stealing. You gain a plus one to your streetwise, but you get kicked out of that job. Um, there's police. I haven't filled in all of those. That should probably be an uneventful year. But you can get a, an injury or you can get accused of a crime. So um, that would be minus one to charisma. I put it as plus one. What am I saying about the police? And minus one to charisma when dealing with law enforcement. You cannot continue in the police. You can work on a farm, which has chances of increasing your stats, but generally will be uneventful. Um, we've got things like criminals. So you can get bonuses to your attributes. You can get long-term uh, friends made in the underworld, which you can use as contacts. You can get contacts with them black market, which gives you a discount when calling on those contacts to get stuff. But you can get injured and scarred, a minus one to your appearance. Caught and jailed, minus two charisma when dealing with law enforcement. And finally, we've got the occult investigator. So plus one to their willpower or plus one to their educa education, plus one to their intelligence, an uneventful year. Or they could get injured by a demon, minus one to their appearance due to the horrific scar wreck, or exposed to demonic ma magic, which has destroyed one point to their willpower. So they gain extra skills, but they stand a chance of bad things or good things happening to them. Now, it might be interesting to add in some variability to this, so these effects are higher up. The uneventful ones tend to be the low numbers, and the more years you stay in something, the more likely there is. So instead of being roll a d6 and it's totally random, it might be d6 plus the years. So you can get some really strong effects or some really risky effects at the high levels. Might be a way of working it. They definitely need more detailed, so explaining what being an occult investigator or what the criminal is, and definitely the effects. So how you made a long-term friend in the underworld, which you can use a contact, etc, etc. But I think it makes for an interesting system. It needs a lot more work, as I said, but it's a nice framework. But anyway, I witted on for way too long as usual, so thank you very much for watching. But most of all, as always, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.